Hey guys, Moan Pobert here, more than 10 times entrepreneur, business buyer, investor. I'm out there looking to buy businesses. We're doing roll-ups in the US, UK. We're looking to buy businesses, sell businesses in pretty much any sector right now. Um, I'm personally looking at roll-ups in different sectors in the UK. We have lots of tech companies that we're trying to sell right now. So that's what I want to share with you, my experience. And uh, I want to share with you some of the experience and lessons that I had with advising other companies. If I'm as their advisor, their mentor, on their board, I want to share with you some of the lessons that I learned over the years um, from scaling from seven to eight figures, or even if you're at six or just starting in the business and you want to learn some of those lessons, even if you don't have a business yet, there's a lot of lessons that you can learn and take from today that can, you can apply immediately. I'll share with you all of those lessons that I saw in advising other people and what worked really well for them to scale from seven to eight figures really, really fast. I'm talking one, two, three years, they can scale from seven to eight or even faster if they're starting from scratch. Lots of, lots of those things that I'm gonna talk about are gonna be kind of like common wisdom, conventional wisdom, but some of those things are gonna be very new to some of you guys, like growing inorganically by going out there and buying complementary businesses, other businesses, competitors, etc. how to leverage other people's money or other financial institutions to do that. And I'm gonna share with it in point number three. And I'm going to share with you all of my thoughts about advisor, board members, does, is it even needed or not? But first, we're going to start about um, kind of like the common wisdom things, which is about sales, marketing, hiring, what kind of people you need to have in your team in order to grow to that level. And again, those are all some of the lessons that we got like in the last year that really made a difference with some of the people that I worked with. Some of those people grew from seven to eight figures by doing organic strategic decisions and growth and some of them by going out there and buying some of their competitors and other complementary businesses in their industry so that's my focus today um yes let's be focused yeah i wasn't sure if we're recording but it's all good it's all live it's a live video so we're good anyway now let's start with point number one which is what most people will tell you to do right is more sales more marketing and most of the i guess strategic business people out there like will teach you about marketing, about sales. They'll tell you that the only way for you to grow a business is to do more sales and more marketing, right? To go out there and make sure that your CAC, your cost to acquire a customer is gonna be as low as possible. And then they'll tell you, hey, calculate your lifetime value of a customer. And they'll tell you when you have that, focus on new ad platforms and focus on your conversion rates. Now, those are all great things that you must do in a business in order to optimize things and grow things over time. And I mean, you gotta know how how much it's going to cost you to acquire a customer, right? You don't know that. You don't have predictability for knowing how much it will cost you to bring in a new client. It will be really hard to scale a business, especially if you want to go out there and raise capital from investors. And I see it a lot in the tech space, especially when companies, they get to a point where they know their CAC, they know the lifetime value, and they know that they want to raise capital. Those are some of the most important KPIs key performance indicators that they got to present to those investors. So obviously it's a must. You got to know how much it's going to take me to go and acquire a customer in whatever platforms that works for you guys. I don't care if you're doing display media or uh, direct outreach or Facebook ads or YouTube ads. You got to know how much it takes you to bring in a customer, right? Then you want to know how much a customer is worth for you over lifetime value. And based on your lifetime value with a customer, you can then decide if and how much you're willing to spend to acquire a customer. Obviously, it depends on your margins and, margins and profits that you want to keep in the end of the day and the bottom line and the net profit, right? New ad channels. Most common wisdom will tell you, hey, if you have one channel that's working well, obviously, make the most out of it. So if you're using Facebook ads, for example, you want to make the most out of it, scale, put all of your resources into that space. But then at some point they'll tell you, hey, also take a percentage of your budget and put it into other channels, right? So let's say if you're using Facebook ads right now, they'll tell you, hey, go and use some YouTube ads, for example, go and use some direct methods. I mean, there's tons of opportunities out there right now. Most common ones right now, everyone's using Google, YouTube, Facebook, I mean, you can use Bing and stuff like that, right? But those are kind of like the main ones. They will tell you, hey, go and use a new channel and test your ads on new channels and spend a lot of a percentage of your cash flow on that new channel to figure out, hey, maybe we can get better returns on YouTube right now versus on Facebook. Now, what about conversion rate? Many people, there are tons of uh, courses and, and softwares and, and advisors out there whose main focus is to just 
make sure that you convert better from lead to sales, from uh, opt-in page, from like your landing page, how can we increase it in like 3%, right? All those small details that again, they are super important, but I'm gonna show you later why, in my opinion, it, it means that you're gonna grow slower because there are so much better things you can do in terms of leverage. And if you're only focused on those things, Yes, you can grow to some extent, but if you want to scale from seven to eight figures, it will take you so much longer. And unfortunately, most people don't know about some of those things we're going to talk about in number three, to take the same cash flow that you have right now to potentially test on new ads, how you can then go and let's just buy companies that already have those platforms uh, proven, basically, if that makes sense. So those are some of the things that people will tell you, hey, focus on that to grow from seven to eight figures. It's amazing. You got to know those things. And obviously... Whenever you have a channel that's working well for you, if Facebook is working well for you, YouTube ads working well for you, put in as much fire, like wood in the right in the fire and grow it like crazy, scale as much as you can. Put the budget. If you already know that you can bring in customer for X, you have a lifetime value of Y, then bring whatever money you can bring to the table, raise from investors, whatever, and spend it or whatever channel that works for you. It's amazing. It's working for many companies out there. The problem is that it will take you a lot of time to get to a point where, first of all, I'm not even talking about getting profitable campaigns, right? So if you're having a hard time to bring in customers for profits on the front end, it will be really hard for you to scale if you don't raise capital from investors. And then you need to think, do I want to be diluted or not? Because if you're going to be diluted, I mean, it's all good, nothing wrong with that, but you got to have money to grow fast. That's what happens a lot with tech companies. They grow, they bring in clients, but they're not profitable from day one. It's going to take them time before they are profitable. So you got to think with yourself, if you want to start a business from scratch and you don't have access to a lot of money, are you able to bring clients and being profitable from day one? If you're not able to do that, it's going to be really hard to scale, right? So that's the first, I guess, common way that people will tell you, hey, grow from seven to eight figure, right? So we talked about CAC, cost to acquire customers. We talked about lifetime value. We talked about testing new ad channels. Like if you're using Facebook, make sure you use YouTube then. And we talked about conversion rates, right? So making sure that you're increasing your uh, cost to acquire a lead or a cost to acquire a customer, what you're doing to making your sales process better, right? If you're doing sales on the phone, how can you increase your process that way? If you're doing sales all online, what can you put on your sales page to increase those percentages? All those things, if you're going to increase those percentage in each and become better in each, obviously you're going to grow over time. If you have the right budget to put into those uh, platforms, assuming so if you're not profitable from day one, it will be, you, you won't be able to scale to, seven, to eight figures, right? No way. Even if you want to scale to seven figures, if you're not profitable from day one on your funnels, it will be really hard to scale. If you know your lifetime value and you're not profitable from day one and you can bring money from outside, outside investors, then there's something to work with. But for most people, they don't want to raise capital because they don't, know, don't want to be diluted. So you got to think about all those things. And again, I'm, there's no right or wrong. I'm just telling you what's out there. And you need to understand that that's the process. You want to go to from seven to eight figures. You're either profitable from day one on your funnel. And if you're not, you got to bring in outside money and be diluted. So that's the first thing. Second thing is at some stage, you'll need to start hiring, right? So number two is hiring people. We've done with number one. Number two, hiring. So Here's the problem with most of the entrepreneurs that I see. Um, it's really hard to be good entrepreneur and a good manager at the same time. Because I think, and I'm not the first one who's saying that, with business, you either an entrepreneur have lots of ideas or you're more of a manager, someone who can take ideas and implement them and, and can do things on a repeat, repeat basis, if that makes sense, and repeating things again and again. For me personally, I like to be the idea person, the one who's thinking about the vision, the strategy, and ideally find the management team in place to run the day to day and handle the small details. Now, for most people, especially if they start a business, I mean, it's really difficult to be both. I mean, to begin with, you probably must be both, but if you want to scale from seven to eight figures, you got to bring in the right people who can complement things that you're less good at. So if you're good with the strategy, with the vision, you must bring someone who's good with the small details. If you're good with the small details, maybe bring someone to help you with the, with the vision and the strategy and the ideas. Although most time it will be difficult to find someone with the vision and strategy to, to work with you. So you, probably if you the small details person, you got to be both to begin with. But then what I'm talking about, let's say you're at seven figures, you're probably not working on your own anymore. And one of the biggest challenges that you have right now is to hire people. 
And if there is something that isn't easy in this world of business is to find good people to work with you. And most of you guys know that. I mean, that's why, especially in the tech space that I'm involved with a lot right now, there's changing management team again and again and again, especially for companies who raise capital from VCs, from venture capital firms. Like sometimes the venture capital firms, they insist to change, to change the management because they don't see the vision and potential with the existing management team in place. So those are some of the challenges you're going to have. Where can I find good people to run the day to day? And it's about bringing the right people to the right seats, right? And if you want to check more about that, definitely check a book by the name of Traction. They go, it's, to, it's talking a lot about how you should uh, organize a business and have the organizational chart and making sure that you have the visionary, the integrator, the person who is involved more in the day to day and making, taking the ideas and implementing them. How we then make sure that we have the right departments. We have the sales and marketing department. We have the operation department. We have the financial department, right? Those are kind of like the key departments in a business. And we got to make sure that we have the right people in each of those departments. And we must make sure that we have the right KPIs in each of those departments that those people, those employees report to us on a week by week basis. If we don't have all those things in a very systematic way, it's going to be really, really difficult for you to scale. So it's about good people and making sure that you need to be flexible and open to change in management. I mean, unfortunately, many businesses to take a business from seven to eight figures, the people who helped you go to seven figures will probably many times won't be the same people that will help you go to eight figures if they can't develop as a people as well. Because many people, they just they stay stuck where they're at. So you got to, first of all, bring good people who are flexible and are willing and open to change. And if you can't do that, it will be really hard to scale. Now, that's about hiring. And another thing that I had in mind with hiring is that, so like I said, we got right people, right seats. We got to make sure that we find the right people. And you need to understand it's really difficult to, to uh, find good people, right? And if some of you guys try to hire people, you know it's not easy. Now, those one and two, those are basically what 98 or 99% of people will tell you that you should grow a business, right? So get better at sales and marketing, get better at hiring. And obviously with hiring, having the right systems, the right procedures, the right organizational chart, right? And with hiring, the best way for you to grow fast is to have systems and procedures down to the T. Like at this stage, if you want to grow to from seven to eight figures organically alone, you must make sure that you have the right processes. So you want to get to a point in your business where you can bring a random person from the street and put him into any task in your business. And that person from the street can now read a manual of step-by-step -step process, what they need to do in order to take over that role inside your business. If you don't have that, if you can't replace people fast, you don't really have a business, you have a business that is dependent on few key individuals. And if they leave, there's no business basically. So a legit, sustainable, established business must have those processes, those manuals, of literally A to Z process, like explaining to a little kid what they need to do exactly. If you don't have that, it's going to be really, really difficult to scale. So again, this is kind of like the end of one and two. And those are crucial if you want to grow from seven to eight figures organically. And that's what most of the people will talk to you about. Now, for me, I want to expand a few more things. I guess advisors, some people obviously talk about that, but I want to tell you kind of like from my uh, point of view, how that applied to especially three. So number three is taking one and two and giving you a new perspective on things, right? So one, uh, sorry, three is organic versus inorganic ways to grow a business. And what that means, organic is basically this. How can we grow, grow internally with doing more sales, more marketing, creating more products internally so let's say right now you have a supplement company, you're selling multivitamins, maybe you now want to create and innovate a new product selling vitamin D or whatever, right? Or a, I don't know, protein powder. So that's internal growth. You're taking your existing team and creating new products, testing new ads, advertising channels, you're hiring more people, everything is being done internally. What I want to open your eyes to is the fact that you can also grow inorganic or external growth, which is to go out there and many times take the same amount of money that you're testing on new channels, take that money and just buy that company that's already existing out there. 
instead of creating everything internally. So for example, like we said, let's say you have a uh, supplement company, you're selling right now multivitamin, and let's say the second product that you want to innovate or bring to the market is uh, a vitamin D, right? Or whatever vitamin, new vitamin you want to sell to the market. One thing you can do is, yeah, innovate, go to the factory and ask for a new product and test new products and then send it to your existing list of clients and see how they respond to that. You can do all that and test sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars just on creating the product and then testing the product and creating new uh, marketing campaigns for those products. And that'll be great, but you can take the same amount of money and just buy an existing vitamin company that have those different products that already have a list of clients and a proven case studies, proven results, proven formula for those products and just buy those businesses. And the way it works is that we're taking whatever capital we already have that created from step number one and two, we take that capital, we then go and find a business that we want, either a complementary business to ours, either your competitor, and you buy them and then you implement them and merge them together. Now, the beauty is when you go out there and try to buy a, a complement your business to yours, a competitor of yours many times, it will take you literally, and I'm going to show you how, the same amount of money, if not less, to buy an existing established business than it is to start from scratch. And the reason for th that it's even possible is that when we buy an existing business, we can use the business assets to pay for the business. So let me give you an example, right? So we talked about a business that we want to buy. Let's say we want to buy another supplement, supplement company. Let's say our business right now is a seven figure business. Let's say it's making $2 million in, in revenues, doing 200,000 in profits, in, in bottom line profits. And we now look for another business selling different vitamins, doing also 2 million in revenues, 200,000 in profit. That business that we're now looking to buy because we present ourselves right now as buyers, as investors, as a, a company that want to grow, or even as an individual entrepreneur who want to start his first business in an acquisition. So like we said, it's basically starting your entrepreneurial journey with buying a business versus starting from scratch. So you can do the same. You don't need to have an existing business, but you can now know to an, go to an existing business that's already existing, already established, already have hundreds of clients, if not more, already have employees, revenues, profits, track record in the market, brand recognition, and you can go to them and you can present yourself as the buyer, obviously get access to all of their data, their financials, sign NDAs if needed for them to feel comfortable sharing their numbers with you. But then whenever you have their financials and their numbers, you can take those numbers and go to financial institutions and they will give you money based on that business assets. For example, every business you have a P&L balance sheet, obviously, and that second business balance sheet now I have lots of assets like cash, uh, inventory, equipment, accounts receivable, sometimes real estate that the, the business is working with or own. And you can take all those assets, like I said, to financial institution that will give you money based on the business that you don't own yet, based on their assets. And same way that you buy a real estate, right? Let's say you want to buy a home. And I'm sure you know people who bought home homes. They can raise money from banks, from financial institutions on a home that isn't even theirs yet, right? And you can do the same with business. And the beauty is that then the money that you made in step number one can be leveraged. I mean, you can take that money and combine that with the money that you raise from financial institutions and you're invincible. And let me share with you even something more exciting is that when you buy an existing business, it's very common that at least 33% of the purchase price for a business will be paid over a period of time. And when I'm saying that, imagine you buying a complementary business to yours right now, you pay them at least 33% over a period of time. That percentage can be paid from the cash flow that the business is already making. So you basically only need to come up with up to, let's say 60% at closing when you're buying those businesses. And at least 30 or 40% can be raised from financial institutions. And then you can bring in the rest of the money from your own pocket that you already created from growing organically to seven figures, for example. So the leverage is insane. And that's like worst case scenario. I mean, I can find many, many deals right now. Like I, I have deals every week coming to me at this day where I can buy them with putting no money whatsoever at day one because the seller is motivated to sell his business. So think about it. Imagine you finding someone who really want to sell his business. He's very motivated. He just want to get out of the business because thousands of reasons, right? Why? It's like you would ask me, why would someone want to sell a house? Same reason applies for businesses. 
Many people want to retire. There are millions of baby boomers who want to retire. They don't know what to do with those businesses. Um, people unfortunately have some uh, family issues or health issues. Many, many reasons. Many times people are just tired running the same business for many, many years and they want to sell it. And when you find those motivated sellers, you can then negotiate even amazing, much more amazing negotiations. You have, you have much more leverage negotiating with those business owners. And when you have that, I mean, the sky is the limit. And you can, like I said, take a business that's making already seven figure a year. Let's say, you, like we said, let's say you have a business doing two million a year in sales. You now go and find other businesses and you find them the same way that you find new customers. You just go and now find business owners instead of finding more clients. So you can now grow instead of one client at a time, you can grow one business at a time. And it's literally the same process that it takes to take one client, to bring one client, same process apply to bring one business. And maybe in the B2C, you can bring clients really fast, like you can make an ad today and bring a client tomorrow. But if you're selling B2B, you all know B2B, like large deals in B2B can take you months. And same here. A business acquisition can take you two, three months. And I'm talking about big, large business acquisition and including due diligence sometimes. So what I'm saying in this case, we can grow one business at a time instead of one client at a time. And if you have an existing business, two million a year in sales, and you find another business doing another two million a year in sales, you now got yourself with one acquisition, a business doing four million a year in sales, $400,000 in profit. And you don't just got yourself more revenues and profits, you got yourself access to more customers, to new ad channels that you know that are converting because that business, the other $2 million business, the vitamin D business, spent thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions on testing those new, those different ad channels that you didn't test yet because you were focused on a different channel. So I, I hope it opens your eyes to what's possible, to all the opportunities of going out there and buying an existing business that's already established, already have a list of clients, products, I mean, track record, case studies, email lists, just think about all the assets that the business have, but you now get immediate access to that. Obviously the employees, think about that. So one and two, now when you're buying a business, you basically get access to all those things at scale, right? So it's basically scale from day one. So think about it. You have a business doing two million a year in sales. You buy, you just need a few deals to get to eight figures. Instead of growing one client at a time, it could take you years to get to eight figures. Here, how many deals do you need to get to 10 million? And I'm telling you, to buy a business doing five million a year in sales or to buy a business doing one million a year in sales, it's the same process. Obviously, ideally, you want to find also someone who's motivated to sell because it's going to help you with the negotiation and then you need less money, if not at all, from your own pocket. Is it better that you have more money from your own pocket, from a business that you grew already? I mean, obviously it's a bonus, but it's not a must. If you start from scratch and you don't even have a business yet, you can still buy those businesses and it's all good. But obviously if you have more capital to play with, it just means that you have access to more deals. It doesn't mean that you don't, you're not able to do deals at all. You can do thousands of deals for no money whatsoever. But if you have access to more capital to play with, then heck, you can buy amazing businesses. And the beauty is, in our case, sometimes the difference between you having fifty to $100,000 can be the difference between you buying literally an incredible business and you buying just an okay business. You see what I mean? So you don't necessarily need a lot of money, if any, but the more money you have, the more opportunities you have to be more, I guess, to make the decision of if and how many businesses you want. Like you have you have more abundance of opportunities, if that makes sense, but it's not a must at all to have access to their capital. So what I'm saying is that when you're growing externally by acquisitions, you get immediate access to all that data of one and two. And that's the beauty, because when you're buying a business, you get immediate access to understanding what's their CAC, the cost to acquire a customer. You immediately can get access to their lifetime value of their customers. You immediately have access to their ad channels and you know what's going on and what's working there already. You immediately have access to their conversion rates and what they did many, many years to build that conversion rate and increase that conversion rate. When you buy an existing business, you also have access to amazing people, to good people that's already working in those businesses. And heck, many times you can have a change in management in your business by buying someone else. Because let's say you, you own, a, like I said, a, a supplement company making vitamin D you can, as the owner of your first business, can now buy a second business and use their CEO or manager to now run both of those businesses, to run, 
run your business and their business. You see what I mean? I hope that makes sense and open your eyes to what's possible. And then you can make a decision. Hey, you know what? I want to step back. I don't want to be involved in the day to day. Let's give that manager of the business that I just bought to buy, to sorry, to manage both of our businesses. And it can just be part of the negotiation. You just negotiate the deal and tell, hey, yeah, part of the deal is you're running both of those businesses. And obviously it's part of the negotiation. Some of the things he'll agree on, some of the things he won't agree on, like maybe a change in culture. Some of you guys might want to bring that business to your office space. Some managers might don't want that. So that's part of the negotiation. It's part of the process. I mean, and I think it's definitely something that you want to consider. Some of you will tell me, hey, you know what? I'm a freak. I want to manage my business. I want to buy that business and I want to make sure that the owner that I just bought will exit and I don't want to see him anymore. And that's okay. I mean, it's up to you. It's up to you what you want to do. For me personally, I don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day. and some of my students want to be involved in the day-to-day, -day. some of them don't want, but it's up to you. You can make the decision now. Do I want to buy a business with a manager who will run the day-to-day -day for me, for both of our businesses, or do I just want to buy a business just for the assets that I have in there? Like, like I said, the list of clients, the products, the distribution channels, the good employee that I have. Like, If you look at some of the biggest businesses out there, like when Facebook bought Instagram or WhatsApp, Obviously, they got access to amazing assets, right? Amazing product, amazing list of clients, huge list of clients. But many times they buy those businesses just for the talent, especially in the tech space. You get access to amazing developers, to have amazing talent that you can't get to otherwise unless you bought that business. And when they bought WhatsApp or Instagram, part of their agreement with WhatsApp and Instagram uh, owners and founders is that those guys have to work at least a few years for Facebook. And obviously they have some issues there, especially with WhatsApp, but it's part of the negotiation. It's part of the strategy. And then you have access to those brilliant minds that you wouldn't be able to access to otherwise because those guys won't leave their amazing job already or their amazing businesses already to work for you unless they have a very huge incentive to do so, which is a very large capital event in the means of exit. They basically sold their business. They made a few million or in their case, few billions of dollars and they will work for you. They'll be very happy to do that. And then it's a win-win for everyone. Facebook can grow their business and WhatsApp or Instagram can continue to grow their business with the new relationship they now have with Facebook. And now you see, I mean, Facebook immediately implemented the ad, their ad platform on Instagram and it looks like they're going to do something similar potentially with WhatsApp. And you can do the same with small businesses. The problem is that most people don't know it's even possible. They think that you got to be a large public company before they do that. And that's what I will open your eyes to what's possible in this space. And it, which leads us to point number four, which is advisors. Most of the people that I work with or advise to or being on their board, they work with advisors. And at the end of the day, the reason they do that is because they don't want to re re reinvent the wheel. They want certainty. They want their connections and they want the accountability. So here's the thing, right? Reinventing the wheel. For me personally, I would never go to or be in my stage in life if I didn't if I needed to reinvent everything from scratch. Everything that I know, I probably learned somewhere else. And if you watch some of my other videos, you know that I spent multiple six figures at least on mentors. And that's just in the business space. I'm not even talking about like self-development and stuff that, like that. And I'm not even talking about mistakes that I made by execution of work, right? So that's why I'm talking about the fact that, hey, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. If you're going to reinvent the wheel, will you be able to get to eight figures eventually? I mean, yeah, potentially, but it will take you much longer. And unfortunately, most startups fail eventually, like 96% of startups fail in the first 10 years. So if you exist for less than 10 years right now, even if you're at seven figure in sales, you're still a startup. So do you want to reinvent the wheel yourself? Probably not. Go and find someone who already doing what you're doing and just copy them and just learn from them and make sure obviously they have the agenda to help you. If in terms of percentage or for some kind of a mentorship exchange in terms of capital, like heck, for me, I still pay a lot of money for mentors and it's worth every penny of my, of the money that I put in there because now I have the excuse to stay in touch with those mentors of mine. So remember guys, don't reinvent the wheel. Get to a point where you have someone who can already show you what's working, especially right now. Even if you have advisors, don't get advisors who work 20 years from uh, worked 20 years ago and maybe their strategies used to work in the past are not working right now find someone who's working right now on doing the things that you want to achieve if it's in deals in buying businesses make sure he's doing it right now and not just teaching you things that used to work with him make sure that he he's there to stay in touch with you on a, on a regular basis and you have actual proximity to him that you can access him directly and not just his team because what his team knows um, it can be very very different to what he personally knows so make sure you have the direct access and support and 
make sure that you ideally also have access to the connections and the role decks that he built if it's in in our case buying businesses to financial institutions to the ways that to find deals right now that's working right now and the accountability because if you don't have the accountability guys i don't care how much information you watch how many books you b bought or read or how many courses or masterminds or week loans events that you attend to or how many videos and like this that you watch even unless you have the accountability and support while you're taking action it's going to be a completely different world right it's like there is a very different world between reading a book about swimming for example and actually jumping into the water when you jump to the water everything is going to be different you now realize hey the, the water are cold right and same with business when you jump into the water you're going to experience new things you're going to have different questions you're, you're going to be overwhelmed many times and emotionally disturbed and you got to have someone to be there for you to help you and direct you in the wrong in the wrong or right directions especially in our space of buying businesses the the wrong mistake here can cost you a small fortune for some people so let me give you an idea right i know people and companies who literally had to bankrupt because they looked at the wrong deals and so for example when you buy a business you need to do due diligence for a business with accountants with lawyers and those companies that the company that i talk about they did due diligence on deals paying accountants and lawyers by the hour like a flat fee no matter what by the hour and think about it when you work with accountants and lawyers who charge you by the hour no matter what what do you think will they want to close the deal or not most likely not because they want to work more hours so one of the ways that i work with some of my the students that i i consult or advise or on their board i make sure that we find accountants and lawyers and we know how to negotiate with them so they only get paid if and when the deal is being done otherwise like the company that I'm telling you, it's a very large company that some of you might know. They literally bankrupt because they try to close a few deals and eventually in the due diligence, they figure out that they don't want to do those deals and they still had to pay multiple six figures in due diligence for each of those, like, for the accountants of lawyers and lawyers, right? And that, that can destroy any business, those fees. So unless you have some kind of agreement where you're only paying for accountants, lawyers, if and when the deal is being done, that alone can destroy you. And there's lots of things in the process that can really screw you if you don't have the right process to find those deals and you're just looking at any deal. Like I know some people who suggest companies or entrepreneurs to cold call companies. And I mean, will that work? Potentially, yes, but we're in 2018 right now, almost 2019. Cold calling, I don't think it's the most effective way to work right now. Can it work? Yes, but it's going to take you so much longer. And again, don't reinvent the wheel because it's going to take you forever, especially if you want to grow to six, eight, seven, eight figures. I mean, can you sustain a six-figure business doing all those ineffective ways? Maybe you don't have any support and accountability, perhaps. But if you want to get big results, you want to get to eight figures, you want to have the lifestyle and be able to step back and have management team in place, you want to then maybe be the strategic person and do more deals, then you got to step up. You got to have get the right advice. You got to ideally grow inorganically as well and grow externally and not just organically. And then you'll have access to all those things again and again and again. You'll have access to better sales, better marketing, obviously better people, better systems, better procedures, and then you'll be able to grow much faster and in a much more sustainable way. So I really hope you got some value here, guys. If you got some value, we're going to put links somewhere below this video for more free training for me. And yeah, I really hope you enjoyed it. Actually, if you watch until now, we're going to put some links below, but if you want also go to moranpober.com forward slash talk. And if you want me and my team and me personally to help you grow your business or to help you buy your first business but buy existing one versus starting from scratch or you want to grow your existing six or seven figure business by acquisitions by going out there and buy some complementary businesses and competitors and leverage other people money opm so if you want some of that help and you want me to help you to scale from seven to eight figures business, like some of my students, like I said, some of the guys I work with bought three businesses in less than a year. Each of those businesses doing at least a million a year in sales. We have a guy, Dan, did more than 30 deals. And those are the type of results that are possible. Is it for everyone? No, but I know that if you're going to follow the right strategy that I'm helping my students to work with and you have the right accountability and support, you can get those amazing results if you're committed to the results and you're not living from your fears and excuses. Is it going to be new for you and overwhelming and sometimes outside of your comfort zone? Yes, obviously, because it's going to be something new for you, especially if you never bought a business before, like anything in life. Every time you do something new, it's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable, uncomfortable at first. 
but trust me after you do one deal you want to go in, you'll want to go in to continue to do that again and again and again it's going to be addicted so if you want to learn more about that how to work with me and you want to schedule a, a call with me and my team to figure out if this this process of growing by acquisitions, buying businesses can fit you. Go to moranpobert.com forward slash talk. You can see the details there. See all the testimonials from all the other guys. See some of the results that are possible and schedule a call with us. I mean, I know for sure that I don't care if you're going to work with us or not. I know for sure it's going to be probably one of the best hours you spent this year. And because we're going to help you figure out where you're at, where you want to go. And let's figure out if we can help you fill that gap. And something that we do as well is if we know that we can't help you, we sometimes redirect you or we will re redirect you if you feel like we can help you to someone else in my network to help you with your outcome. So no matter what, we just want to make sure you get value, you get clarity, and we can help you figure out if we can help you with your outcomes and ideally get you to a point where you're doing at least eight figures in sales or maybe even more. Eventually, maybe we can even help you exit some of those companies for eight figures in cash, bottom line, into your bank account. And that's where you can add a lot of value to you as well. We have access to lots of buyers out there who are looking for great businesses. And that's some part of the work that we're doing with our clients. We help them buy businesses, doing roll-ups, and then potentially position them for exit for large multiples and uh, capital events. So I really hope you got some value here, guys. See links again somewhere below this video or go to moanpaber.com forward slash talk if you want to schedule a call with us directly. Other than that, I really, really hope you got some value here. Um, if you like it, share this video with your friends or someone you think can, can get value from this. And yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you soon.